In my last video, I started converting this old HP microserver into a much more powerful and definitely unique little home server. So far, everything's gone perfectly. Well, except for killing a motherboard, butchering a paint job, and the fact that the internals of this system currently look like this. But in this video, we're going to fix all of that with a bit of ingenuity, persistence, and a ton of soldering, crimping, and 3D printing. By the end of this video, we should have a little beast of a home server with a discrete graphics card, 96 terabytes of storage, a relatively modern, low-power motherboard, and even a working Blu-ray drive. However, that's assuming nothing else goes wrong. Although there were a few hiccups along the way, I was pretty happy with how this system was looking at the end of part one. But there were already a few things that bugged me, starting with the white lettering on the Blu-ray drive. So, that's much better. And that should do it for the optical drive. But speaking of drives, we haven't even talked about hard drives yet. And considering we're building a home server NAS system here, that's probably pretty important. Typically, I just use some four terabyte Western digital drives for testing, but I've put a lot of work into this thing and wanted to go with something with a bit more capacity. Six times the capacity to be exact. That's because the sponsor of this video, Server Part Deals, hooked me up with four 24 terabyte Seagate drives. If you're not familiar, Server Part Deals is one of the largest retailers for manufacturer recertified drives. If you're in the market for some hard drives, the recertified drives from Server Part Deals can save you a ton of money, letting you stick to your budget, but also buy more or higher capacity drives. One thing I personally love about buying recerts is that you can often buy one or two extra drives for spares while still spending the same or even less than if you bought them new. And I know some people are going to be hesitant about buying non-new drives, but Server Part Deals manufacturer recertified drives come directly from the manufacturer and then go through an extensive testing process at Server Part Deals. There, they not only check the smart data and perform read and write tests, but also run performance benchmarks and selective sector scans to check each sector of the drive. Because of this, the chance of getting a dead on arrival drive is honestly sometimes lower with recertified drives than it is with new ones. Plus, they offer free two-day shipping on all orders, and the packaging is honestly probably the best I've ever seen, so you don't have to worry about your drives arriving in anything less than perfect condition. And if something does go wrong, their incredible support staff is there to help with any technical issues or RMA requests. So if you're in the market for some hard drives, make your hard-earned dollars go further by checking out server part deals using my link down in the description below. At this point, the case was looking fairly decent, but what good is a case without the system inside? In part one, I printed this placeholder motherboard tray so that I could start figuring out where components would go, such as the motherboard, PCIe adapter, and a five volt relay to sync up the NUC with the power supply for all of the drives. But you might have also noticed this little prototyping board. With all of the cables coming from the NUC, power supply, front panel, and relay, I decided it might make things a bit easier and more organized if I had essentially just a little junction board that everything could connect to. My plan was to have a connector going to the ATX power supply for the power supply on signal, ground, and also 5 volts. The power supply on and ground would be connected to the relay, which would get closed via 5 volts from the NUC. That 5 volts would come from the NUC's front panel header, along with ground, and connections for the hard drive LED, power button, and power button LED. And if you're wondering, I just split this into 3 and 5 pin connectors, just so I wouldn't get things mixed up. Then there were connections that would go to the front panel for the power button and LED, as well as the logo LED, and what were originally the hard drive and network LEDs. One of the top two LEDs would still be for hard drive activity, but the other would now just come from a 5 volt rail on the ATX power supply, essentially just as a confirmation that it was switched on. Since I was planning to replace the tricolor logo LED with just a plain white LED, I planned to power that using 5 volts from the NUC front panel. To make the connections easy to plug and unplug, I used these JST HX connectors that I picked up in a kit on Amazon. After soldering those into place, I just ran all of the necessary wires and also dropped in two resistors for the logo and power supply LEDs. It doesn't look great, but it should get the job done. It took a little while, but I was eventually able to figure out how to crimp the JST connectors to make my own custom cables. I made some cables to connect to the five volt relay and then after sacrificing an ATX24 pin adapter, I was able to make a custom cable to hook up to the power supply. The front panel header on the NUC wasn't so easy. Instead of a more common 2.54mm pitch connector, the NUC boards use a smaller 2mm pitch. Because of this, the only connectors I could ship in time for filming were these 2x10 female headers, which are meant for soldering through PCBs, not to wires. That wasn't going to stop me though. And yeah, I know this is probably a terrible idea, but if I really wanted to, I could make a better cable later on after waiting for the proper connectors to show up. 
But I needed something quick, so, well, this is what I ended up with. All the connections seemed to work, but to make sure everything was a bit more solid, I used some hot glue to reinforce things a bit. And to hide just how ugly this all was, I also added a bit of heat shrink. After terminating the other end of that monstrosity with the JST connectors, I now had a connection from the motherboard to the little junction board. Before moving on to the front panel, I wanted to finish the motherboard tray. I designed some standoffs for all of the components, and also made holes in each of those for some heat set inserts. This was my first time using these, and man are they satisfying. I could literally sit here all day just doing this. With all of those in place, dropping in the boards was easy. Well, at least the first three, not the PCIe adapter. That's because it didn't have enough clearance on the bottom for it to sit at the correct height. I possibly could have made a hole in the bottom of the tray or something, but instead I just tried removing this little plastic piece that protects the solder joints on the bottom. With that removed, there was just barely enough clearance for the adapter to screw into place. It was a bit tricky, but I eventually finagled the NVMe ribbon cable to where I could plug it into the board, and also added in the mini SAS adapter to the B key slot. I snapped off this extra piece, but it was still a bit too long to actually screw into place. But double-sided tape does exist, so that wasn't an issue. And with that, the main pieces of my motherboard were essentially finished. Well, as long as it would actually all fit in the case. Nice! Oh, wait, nope, I forgot the cable that plugs into the nook board. Uh, crap. The good news is that I accidentally soldered on one of the wires to the wrong pin anyway, so I was going to have to redo all of that regardless. On my second attempt, I made sure to double check the wiring, but I also used considerably less hot glue. This made bending the connection to an acceptable height much easier. I also needed to make sure the GPU would fit properly, and uh, well, yeah, that's a problem for later me. This Intel A310 fit, and I had no issues sliding that into the case. The PCIe slot was slightly off, but close enough to make it work. I'll take it. Okay, so everything seemed to fit, but would it all work properly? Well, at this point, there was really only one way to find out. All right, moment of truth here. Okay. Nice. Seeing the system post properly and all of the devices listed was extremely satisfying. Almost as satisfying as the sound of the relay when the system turned on and off. Oh, it's so sick! <laughs> At this point, all that was needed to finish off the wiring was the front panel. I started things off with the power button and LED, desoldering the original wires, and then resoldering my own. I then crimped the opposite ends with the JST connectors. Nice. Next were the two LEDs that were next to the power button, which were originally for network and hard drive activity. These were originally green, and I wanted to swap them out with some 3mm white LEDs. So I wired those up, crimped the opposite ends, and then just hot glued them into place. Nice! Oh wait, nope, that's right, one of them doesn't work. Why did I hot glue this into place before testing it? Never mind. After replacing that LED with a new one, it worked great except, oh my god, it's bright. So I calculated the proper value for the resistor so that the LEDs wouldn't burn up, but I didn't consider the brightness. So I replaced the 100 ohm resistor I originally used with a 220 ohm resistor. And I didn't replace the second resistor on the board because that was gonna be for the logo LED. And since that uses a diffuser, I wanted it to be as bright as possible. With that done, the front panel was finished. Well, except for the USB ports, but who needs those, right? Okay, yeah, we probably need those. Fortunately for all of the proprietary junk that was on this HP board, the USB 2 connectors were just the standard 9-pin connectors like you would find on any normal motherboard. The bad news is that I wasn't using a normal motherboard. The Nook uses these tiny 4-pin Molex PicoBlade connectors. So I bought a little kit of connectors and pre-crimped wire. Each connector on the board is for one USB 2 connection, with pins for 5 volts, ground, and data plus and minus. The standard 9-pin USB 2 connector is essentially just double that. So I made a cable for each USB header on the board, with the Molex connector on one end, and then four DuPont pins on the other. Determining ground and 5 volts was easy, and I correctly assumed that the data pins would just be in the same order as the 9-pin header. 
This meant that I could at least get two of the four front USB ports working. And yeah, it might be a bummer for the top two USB ports just to not work, but I like to think of that as a security measure. And with that, most of the work on the front of the case was pretty much done. On the back though, well, there was still that giant gaping hole where the rear IO used to be. Now I could have made a custom plate that fit the rear IO of the NUC board, but while well, you might've noticed that the board isn't all the way pushed to the back of the case. And even if it was, it's backwards. I actually positioned it that way to be able to connect the PCIe adapter and also to position the mini SAS adapter so that the cable from the back plane could eventually reach it. But this meant that I couldn't directly use the rear IO from the NUC, but I never planned to. Instead, I made a plate that could just stick to the back of the case with holes for a barrel jack and an RJ45 keystone coupler. And it only took me three tries to nail down the print so that the keystone jack could actually snap into place. Now, if I just used a plate like this, the coupler was going to be so close to the motherboard that I couldn't actually plug a cable into it. So I designed it so that it would stick out a bit. I also added some little holes for these magnets. That way it could just snap on and off as needed. For the barrel jack, I just grabbed this 5.5 millimeter barrel extension, which just stayed in place with friction. I had to shorten that cable a bit though, and also crimped a short ethernet cable as well. In the last video, I printed this little handle to replace the lock on the front door. I also forgot to film painting it. In this video, I somehow also forgot to film me putting another one of those heat set inserts into the end of it. I at least managed to get the footage of me setting up the soldering iron to do so though, so there's that. With the insert in place, I could snap on this retaining washer and then screw on this little locking arm piece that, well, I also 3D printed because somehow I lost the original. Look at that. On the inside of the front panel, I glued in the power button as well as this little clear LED cover thingy. I was really sick of hot glue at this point, so I used super glue instead. Now, if you remember, I had an issue earlier with this larger RTX 3056 gig not fitting because of the relay. Fortunately, that was an easy fix. I just lowered the standoff height for the relay board and lowered some of the other boards as well just for a bit more clearance. I also added this cutout to hopefully give the CPU fan a bit more breathing room. And lastly, I added these little tabs on the front to be able to lock the tray in place. Once that was printed out, I added the heat set inserts again and then screwed in all of the components. And now, finally, we could try to assemble this entire thing. <laughs> I'm not going to act like I extensively planned things out for this project, but I did at least check that the mini SAS adapter wasn't going to interfere with anything else in the system. That is, until you actually plug in the cable. Then the connector sits right in the middle of where the system fan was going to go. Honestly, airflow is overrated, and I just decided to keep pushing forward. I mean, having a fan isn't that big of a deal, and as long as we don't run into any other issue- I forgot to say the cable. Oh my god. So while I did have a Molex to dual SATA adapter so that I could power the Blu-ray drive and the PCIe slot, I forgot about the actual data connection for the Blu-ray drive. I had originally planned to use the SATA port that the Nook had for an extra two and a half inch drive, but I forgot to hook up the little ribbon cable for it. I also forgot that I would need an extension for said cable, and the only one I had was for both power and data. Nothing a little rotary tool magic can't fix. At this point, there were more cables than I anticipated having and getting it all in the case was a huge pain, but I eventually got everything shoved in there. And I still don't know exactly why, but for some reason I could not get the door and top panel to go on correctly. It literally took me over 10 minutes to finally get them situated. But after that, it was done. Unfortunately, when trying to get the top panel on, the paint on the door slightly got chipped, which was a bit frustrating to say the least. And speaking of frustrating, this entire project has been pretty frustrating, partly due to my negligence, but also thanks to all of the proprietary parts and connectors that HP decided to use. So I didn't have any desire to put their logo back in. Instead, I found this to be a bit more fitting. Oh yeah, we should probably see if this even works. After plugging in the ATX power supply and the NUC, the system immediately kicked on and all of the lights worked. 
Well, the power LED was wired up backwards, but that was an easy fix I took care of later. The system seemed to be turning on, but I wasn't getting any video signal from the GPU. After panicking just a little bit, I went through the painful process of pulling the motherboard tray out so that I could plug directly into the HDMI port. And that worked perfectly. It didn't hit me until then that I probably wasn't going to be able to access the BIOS in the Nook using a discrete GPU because, well, they probably never expected someone to do this. With the system seemingly working as it should, I put everything back into the case and then secured the motherboard tray with a thumbscrew. Now, I hadn't added the 24 terabyte drives up until this point because, well, I was not in the mood to kill any more expensive hardware. But after sliding in the last drive and hitting the power button, everything spun right up. I booted Unraid from a USB, and everything showed up as it should, including the Blu-ray drive. Also, the drive stayed fairly cool, especially considering there wasn't a case fan. I could probably 3D print a fan bracket similar to the IO Shield and just stick it to the back. I could maybe even cut off the fan grill so there isn't something restricting the airflow. And as much as I maybe should do that, I think I'm going to end things here. I never meant for this project to be perfect, and it's definitely not perfect. Aside from the obvious lack of a fan, the paint on the front is chipped, two of the USB ports don't work, you can't get to the BIOS without using the HDMI port, which is incredibly difficult to get to, and frankly, the chance of this being a fire hazard is greater than zero. But in real life, things are rarely perfect, and I like this imperfect little system. I had a lot of questions in part one asking why I would even do something like this when you could just buy insert thing here, and as much as that gets annoying, it's not an unfair question. I mean, if you're looking for a good value for Bay NAS for a home server that can store and stream your media, this isn't the best option. In fact, it's probably a terrible option. What this was though, was a really fun project. Yeah, at times it may have caused me to swear, cry, and genuinely doubt whether or not I would even be able to finish it. But I also learned a ton. My paint job was by no means good, but I learned a lot in the process, and I have a feeling the next case I paint will look much better. I also got to work on my CAD and 3D printing skills quite a bit, and became a master at crimping JST connectors. I also learned the importance of slowing down and having a clean workspace, especially when electricity is involved. And I also just had a ton of fun making this, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. If so, you might want to check out this other video of mine where I made another, well, very unique looking home server. If you're interested in doing something similar, or just want to see some of the various parts I used, I'll make sure to have some links down in the description. Also, while this video is not sponsored, I want to give a huge shout out to Bamboo Lab for providing my two 3D printers. And if you're interested in getting into 3D printing, I highly suggest picking up an A1 Mini. I also want to say thanks to Server Part Deals for sponsoring this video and sending over those 24 terabyte drives. And lastly, I want to thank you for watching this video and putting up with my shenanigans. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.